Hello, back again. Second video of the day. Um, and I've got the tarot out. Um, I've just done a video on uh, the pen sound recommendations. So if you get anything from that, that's grand. Um, given that I was uh, so inclined to do that list, I thought. You know, it was upmost in my mind after that. I was thinking, well, you know, I've already said there's like four or five people, you know, who really had quite an influence on me, at least not so much now, but definitely a decade ago. Um, I thought I might just get into one of them and uh, talk about Charles Olson. I um, wonder what my tarot deck makes of Charles Olson. L'amore, the choice, interesting, uh, it's a choice, you can take him or leave him, um, Charles Olson, what do I like about Charles Olson, I have family in Newfoundland, and uh, I haven't visited them as much as I want to, but it's a rocky landscape and it's the eastern shores of that continent and there's something quite interesting about that vibe and although I've never lived in New England um, that is the vibe it's a fisherman's vibe you know um, my uncle is a fisherman or was a fisherman so that 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 there's a personal connection there um, He's, he's a public intellectual at a time when that was kind of okay. I don't think we have many of those anymore, particularly not in Britain, and nobody you'd want to listen to regularly. Um, not to my mind, unless you've got Christopher Hitchens or some malarkey like that. I don't uh, put much stock in many of these people anymore, but I'd like to think, and perhaps this is my projecting onto American culture uh, an alien thing that it is not really it's it maybe it's a lot more mundane than I'm making it which is what you do I guess the grass is always greener and all that but I think there might be something genuine to it which is that some point between the late 50s and the late 60s um, what was fascinating about the pen sound and it would be I mean it probably more useful to you watching this video after the pen sound video um, but the thing for me was fascinating was um, just the fact that you've got large halls of people listening to a man talk about poetry or reading poetry and clapping and applauding in a, in a very civilized um, way I mean at my experience in England is not like that now that's not to say that England is not lyrical or poetic the other thing that seems to happen in Britain which which didn't if you compare it to that time in America the thing that's different is is that there's not really a culture of talking about poetry now there might be now I can't speak for the last 20 years in, in education for example but I think what seems to happen is is that the, the, the literary impulse or the poetic impulse in Britain at least manifests itself in the form of entertainment more than it does any intellectual endeavour and that's that's different from say 200 years ago we know that Coleridge gave a series of lectures and I'm sure Wordsworth was in public um, speaking now and again as well so it's not that we've not had that, but I don't think we have that on a mass scale in Britain. What tends to happen is you have a, a, a series of, of published poets who gain, you know, small reputations for themselves, and they give readings usually that are connected with um, ac the academy. And often they work within the academy and they have this little, you know, number of places that they can visit and give talks or perhaps guest lecture or whatever it does happen but it's either that 
or it's in the context of music and entertainment in a pub night. Um, I'm sure that happens in America too. But but what I found fascinating, because I'm not much of a pub guy. I mean, I like to go for a drink and socialise in a pub, but I'm not. I don't. We don't have as many events um, in pubs as we, we we used to say in the '90s. I would say. What am I trying to get at? Um, the context is interesting. Um, you don't really get talks by people who I would rate as first class minds and they have hundreds of people come to listen to them uh, I've also been out of the country for the last 15 years so I may be way off base here somebody could say to me oh no this is a vibrant thing in England Andrew but as far as I know it doesn't seem to happen so the refreshing thing about listening to say an Olsen talk on Penn Sound is that like I say for, for a short period of about 10 years you get this sense whereby entertainment, any intellectual impulse is combined and people are actually going to listen to poets to figure out who they are and what's going on in the world and not just for something to pass the time for 20 minutes while they're having a couple of drinks with their mates. Um, that is interesting. Um, and it seems to me that Charles Olson the reason I'm talking about this in relation to Charles Olson is because it something about those recordings that, that, that give you that sense more intensely than listening to any other um, poet on that website. Um, I mentioned at least three or four other names that I highly recommended. Um, so, so we've got that sense of Olson as a uh, a seasider which is a funny term for a black puddlian by the way which is where I'm from but somebody who's of the shore of the coastline which I think is interesting then you have Olsen as the Scandinavian the guy that's a kind of a, a wayfarer a voyager and a seaman although he, he himself he says that he wasn't uh, much of a, a a ship dweller or whatever but a lot of his writing is obsessed with that and and that 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 seems obvious that he would say start talking about Herman Melville who's a a great writer that I love um so yeah there's this sense of freedom of the sea in in the poetry um before I go on it's also worth mentioning the video, if you don't know, this is for people who don't know Charles Olson, or a good way into him is a, a good video called Charles Olson and the Persistence of Place, I think it's called. You can look it up on YouTube. Um, that gives you just uh, some biographical background to Charles Olson. Um, and it gives you some sense of what he wanted to do. He had a project, so he was kind of a poet with a project. He wasn't simply reading poetry. He was reading intensely into philosophy. Now, the problem here, before I go on, is that for people who are, say, anti-modernists or, or definitely anti-postmodernists, Olsen kind of gets lumped into this postmodern category. Now, why would that be? I think because he was reading a lot in history and in mythology and in philosophy, and he was writing in, in sometimes abstract terms he tends to get lumped into that category. He was not a beat writer. He was definitely not Jack Kerouac. And I think this is kind of unfortunate that, 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 that Olsen has got that brand postmodern because I think there's some things that you can take from Charles Olsen even if you were, say, a very right-leaning person. Olsen's po uh, politics would be, he would be somewhere between a classic liberal and uh, an old style 19th century Democrat. He was not a fan of Kennedy, interestingly, um, but I've never heard him say much about any other figures in American politics to, to help me gauge that. Um, to me, the, the talks come after that. So say you watch the video, uh, Charles Olson and the Pers Persistence of Place, and then you, 
you get onto the talks, the general talks or lectures first, and then you get to the poetry and perhaps you buy a book or two. That seems to be the best way to deal with it. Um, another fascinating thing that I th thought was interesting, um, there's a very famous talk to people in the know or, of the, or of, who are of that generation who were paying attention to somebody like Olson would be that um, he gave a he gave a number of big big lectures that were well attended um, 63 in Vancouver if you go to the Robert Creeley page on Penn Sound I think the Vancouver discussions everything got recorded now that it's a real seminal event in the sense that tons and tons of stuff got recorded I think there were two or three discussions every day and maybe w a week at least of um, space available for people to for poets to discuss poetry and they're all being recorded as they talk that's a very useful thing for somebody like me um, so he also gave a, a very well-known lecture at the 63 Vancouver Festival uh, Poetry Festival and then again in 65 but I could be getting this wrong um, the 65 one I can't remember if that's in Vancouver or not anyway the point I'm making is is that uh, his reputation does rise over the years somewhere between the mid 50s and the mid 60s again as with often with poetry it's within a certain milieu it's not like the whole of the populace they're not asking him to be on television giving interviews but he's got like a, he's definitely got a following within the country and he's still a slightly off kilter figure he's not well known to everybody and any any writer that did get a certain amount of fame like Kerouac you know he actually name checks Olsen just to kind of get Olsen into that you know to get people thinking about Olsen in a more wider wider realm of acknowledgement um, that was never going to happen because uh, as much as I like America is a cultural force in the world uh, people just uh, you know they're not able to access poetry not spiritually able to deal with it uh, most of them and so um, you know you can look at it positively or negatively we have the books we have the recordings you can do with them whatever you want I think Olsen in his um, political thinking was like Pound, he was way ahead of his time. Um, the biggest giveaway is the 65 reading that I just mentioned and that is why I just mentioned it. Now it's a very contentious reading because even the people who liked him didn't necessarily like that reading. Robert Duncan actually notes down in a letter to Denise Levitoff, if I remember, if I remember rightly. Olsen came in drunk and drinking and it's a very um, totally off the cuff speech which goes on for three hours I think or maybe even longer and that you'd never get away with that in British culture now you wouldn't you couldn't get away with it in the 60s in British culture to be honest um, it would be way 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 off off the beat of most people's awareness um, so it's fascinating. I'm one of these people that happens to like it, uh, perhaps like it intensely. Because you hear in the Olsen recordings, even earlier to that, is that there's always this impatience. And, uh, and I guess this is always the way with poets, is that you've got a small group in front of you. You're lucky to have them, but you want the wider recognition, as most poets do. So there's always, the, you know, there's always this half impatience in Olsen's voice when he's dealing with going to academies and talking to people. He has to fathom how much they know about poetry and about literature in the 20th century or before. Uh, most of the academies wouldn't have taught these, these proto-listeners anything of 20th century poetry, never mind American 20th century poetry. And then, of course, you got, it's, it's what Robin Blazer calls the money problem. You've got to support yourself. And also in his later years, you know, you get tired, more and more tired of talking to people who, you know, that they're, they're just kind of dealing with Carl Sandburg or they're just dealing with some, or maybe Dylan Thomas, if you look at, you know, they're only dealing with like uh, more well-known writers that have come through in the previous decades. I mean, I mean, that's fine. I mean, you have to be patient on whatever level. Um, if, you, if you're a writer, you have to, you have to 
understand that uh, there are gaps in people's knowledge and your own knowledge is totally fallible as well. But the 65 reading is so interesting because he seems to have abandoned all attempt to, to be logical. And because he's not in a university, um, well, I don't think he's, he might be in a university, but he's not. He doesn't deem the listeners to be university bred. So he's basically, and he and he's and he's drunk, right? So he's basically, or at least he's half cut. So what he's doing is he's just doing whatever he bloody well feels like in front of people, and often it's you know as with any drunk, it's pathetic, just um, egoistic appeals to to a certain members of the audience that happen to be poets. Um, this kind of thing, addressing people as if you're in a study group instead of in a massive lecture hall. Um, you know, forgetting his poetry and asking people for books and things like that. And and then just basically refusing to read poetry um, for at least two, at least, I would say at least two thirds of that, 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 that talk or whatever it is, that reading is not reading. I mean, it's not um, reading his poetry at all. He's got, he wants to vent spleen and he wants to say whatever he feels like saying and he's managed to get a captive audience but even then you hear as the talk goes on that particularly the last hour people are slowly leaving because he's drunk and he's rambling and people don't like that I, I, I'm not I'm a I like interesting things interesting events and people saying interesting stuff so I've listened to that talk quite a few times actually because I just think it's interesting when a poet gets irate with people and why would he do that and what would he have to say? What is the cause of his irritation and what has he got to say as a consequence of that? So on a conspiracy level, I find it fascinating. I'm kind of building up to this over the last five minutes. I mean, there's, I think in the middle of that talk he says, is there or is there not a business conspiracy between America and Russia? something of that ilk. Now I'll get onto this in relation to Eustace Mullins and Ezra Pound. But Olson, we've got to remember he was born in 1910, so he's Dylan Thomas's generation. So he's had 50 years, of, he's had 55 years of life now, and you're dealing with a generation that's come up after the Second World War, and a lot of things have been covered up in the culture, right? So when Ezra, and, and Ezra Pound's speeches, regardless of what you make of them in a racial sense, Ezra Pound spills the beans on who is creating the money in the US, right? And he's pointing the finger at certain groups of people and he's clouded a little bit by his prejudice of anti-Semitism, but essentially he gets it right. And I would, I'll, I'll do a whole talk just on the, the speeches, but I'm saying that because Olsen, whether he's imbibed that directly from Ezra Pound, and I don't think he has, the information that he's seen, uh, managed to gain over the previous decades will tell you outright that we've got the seeds of what you would call Ikean conspiracy theory now in the mid-60s. Olsen was aware of it, and obviously Pound was aware of it before him. And just that one question to the audience floors everybody. The whole, it sounds like the whole theater goes quiet because people don't know about any of this stuff. And, and I'm guessing they're, they're buying, uh, this is another contentious issue. They've got the Holocaust to deal with. They've got, they've got very prevalent streams of knowledge in the mainstream and they don't really know where to get their information from. And it's only as you get older, I mean, I don't know the effect of the internet, but then, it's only as you get older and you study deeper that you're going to fathom something like um, some form of uh, ideological construct within the Russian government. Um, and it's made up of American industrialists. And if it isn't, then at least it was in its inception had that influence. That's a fascinating statement for me in the middle of a three hour drunken talk. So, of course, you know, you're going to listen to the end. <laughs> so he's well ahead of his time. Um, and he shouldn't just be dismissed as just another postmodern, because I think what's happening now in 
British culture, whether you get into poetry or writing or not, is that um, there's this need to wipe away, you know, decades of the past because it's useless. I mean, as much as I don't like British poetry the last 40 to 50 years, I wouldn't wipe, wipe anything away. I wouldn't say don't go near it. It's all useless. You, you can't be too dogmatic about these things. Uh, the other thing with poetry is I find when you study poetry going back centuries, and Duncan repeats this in one of his talks, is, look, you might get a century where there's hardly anything. No new information. No new bardic impulse. No, nothing very interesting. I mean, just off the cuff, I think about the 18th century. It wasn't very good for poetry. It might have been good for other disciplines. Uh, I wouldn't dismiss it entirely. Uh, you get William Blake coming in towards the the last third of it. Um, you get a couple of other people. But, you know, there are just fallow periods. Um, anyway, what am I talking about? But anyway, so, so yeah, it's interesting that you have this, this these last attempts of Olsen. And the other problem with Olsen is he does sound like he's on some kind of downer as well. Like... Um, there are reasons for all of this. I, I forgive, you know, I, I forgive, you know, drug addictions. And I, I mean, I wouldn't advise it of anybody. But I think his wife had died uh, pretty quickly into the 60s. I can't remember when she died. And, you know, he's having to hustle work teaching and growing and growing as a poet. And if you grow and grow as a poet, you're coming into more and more information usually. And that doesn't always jive with, with the people around you, particularly if you're in an academic setting. So my Olsen is that that rebellious Olsen that, that, that can function outside of the, the academy and that still exists in the texts themselves and in certain talks and stuff like that. And again, I was always fascinated with Olsen from the beginning because of that sense of the sea and of the freedom of the sea, the, the Melvillian aspect of Olsen. So what I thought I'd do, I won't spend too long on this video, but I'll do a few readings and try to give you a sense of Charles Olsen. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. I've got a few books here. I'm lucky enough to have picked these up. I don't think some of these editions are tricky to get hold of, especially for a Brit. Uh, if you're an American, you might be able to get some of these things. First of all, the other thing about Olsen's books when they were published is that they're massive. Um, have we got a light there? I've got three volumes. That's the first one. came out in 1960. This is an original, the Jargon edition. This is the, the follow-up. They're all called the Maximus Poems. If you know Olsen, you'll know that was his main project. You know, this, this notion of Pangaea, or, or that he's, he's massively into cosmology and geology and all this, the notion of how the continents changed over time. I won't get into that too much in this um, video. So that's the second volume of the Maximus, and that's the third hope that's visible and they're all in these big chunky uh, massive books um, so we'll have a look I'll just pick and choose I want uh, a little bit like the other videos I'll just choose vaguely at random I've got a few poems that I've marked but other than that we'll just kind of wing it that's the collected poems which are um, extra to the Maximus uh, so that's, a, that's quite a big volume as well um, there's a few things in there. I'm going to start with this one, and then I'll work through the Maximus. What I'm not going to do in this video is really um, explain too much uh, of, of his poetic project. I'm, I'm more interested in him as a teacher. Um, I'm not sure it's really my place. I mean, if you like the poems I read, and you don't have any Olsen, go ahead and and uh, pick, pick up some stuff. Uh, those three volumes I just showed you, by the way, are now in one volume, but they'll still probably cost you at least 25 quid, probably. Um, the whole of the Maximus, I would imagine, and I don't think they've been published recently. So I'm going to start with the last first. So we'll go back in time with Olsen. Um, this is well known. It's used in the, the, the Olsen video that I recommended. Um, 
I just think it's a good one. He was very irate. He did not go the Joycean route. And by, by the way, he didn't like Joyce at all. The Joycean route would be, my version of it would be, ambiguous politically. Um, and not getting het up about stuff. Olsen was, was very irate. Could be very irate. And public sometimes you know like dealing with poetry as a public form a little bit like Yeats in a way and that's part of the Yeats that I don't like but some for some reason I, I like it in Olsen um, so it's, this is a well-known poem it's quite long but it gives you a sense of what Olsen thinks about American history as well um, praise another little preface would be he lived in uh, Jesus, what am I? Uh, he lived in uh, Massachusetts, um, so he's talking about Dogtown is the name that he uses in the poetry. Um, uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts, of course. I forgot the name for a second. Uh, he becomes more and more local towards the end, and this is this is actually sent to the I think it's the Gloucester News or some local. I'm um, just improvising a title but it's a local newspaper a scream to the editor moan the loss another house is gone bemoan the present which assumes its taste bemoan the easiness of smashing anything moan Solomon Davis house gone for the YMCA to build another of its cheap benevolent places bankers raise money for and who loan money for new houses each destruction doubles our loss and doubles bankers gain when four columns bemoan a people who spend beyond themselves to flourish and to further themselves as well made the solomon davis house itself was such george washington could well have been inaugurated from its second floor and now it is destroyed because 70 years ago Gloucester already could build the Y and Patillo's equally ugly brick front and building. Between them the Davis house, then 50 years old, was stifled, squeezed in no light on one side, a patch of soil like a henyard toward Patillo's. Houses live, or else Y is one room in 90 Middle Street worth a hundred thousand dollars to the Metropolitan Art Museum. If taste is capital of this order, had not Cape Ann Historical Scientific and Literary Society or Cape Ann Historical Association, if John Babson, the historian, founded both the above-mentioned society and the Sawyer Free Library and was a banker too and wrote with two others the principal history of Massachusetts banking to his time. How many ways can value be allowed to be careless with and Hagstrom destroy? How many more before this obvious dullness shall cease? O oh, city of mediocrity and cheap ambition, destroying its own shoulders, its own back, greedy present persons stood upon, stop this renewing without reviewing. Loss, 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 no gains, oh, not moan, stop, stop, stop this. Total loss of surface and of mass, putting bank parking places with flowers, spaces dead, so dead, in even the sun, one does not even know one passes by them. Now the capitals of Solomon Davis House, now the second floor behind the black grillwork, now the windows which reach to, now the question, who if anyone was living in it, now the vigour of the narrow and fine clapboards on the back, now that flatness right up against the street. One is in despair, they talk and put flowers up on poles high enough so no one can water them. And nobody objects when houses which have held and given light a century, in some cases two centuries, and their flowers aren't even there in one mouth. The electric company's lights are there every night to destroy the colour of colour in human faces. 
Main Street is as sick at night as Middle Street is getting banker good in sunlight. A swimming pool is now promised where Solomon Davis sat beside the Dale house and looked with some chagrin at Sawyer's not as tasteful house across the way. I'm sick of caring, sick of watching what, known or unknown, was the ways of life. I have no vested interest even in this which makes life. Moan nothing. Hate, hate, hate. I hate those who take away and do not have as good to offer. I hate them. I hate the carelessness. For $25,000 I do not think anyone should ever have let the YMCA take down Solomon Davis house for any purpose of the YMCA. So he has a few of these like towards the end of his life and they're just interesting as a way in like to give you the cultural context for Gloucester in the mid 60s and, and apparently according to the video it's just gotten worse really. And, you know, if I look at my um, uncle's life, it's the same. Like, people just get made bankrupt. There's no fishing being done. There's no local trade, no local business. And it's the corporations taking over. So you get these letter format poems now and again, uh, which are really interesting. Um, and I'll come back to this big fat volume of a thing. Um, that That's something... I mean, it's pretty much secondary to the Maximus. But uh, I thought it worth having. I said I wouldn't explain too much the poetic project, but I guess for, for reasons of vaguely understanding, uh, it's worth saying a few things. Um, Maximus of Tyre is a, is a figure from, I think it's third century Greek history or something around that. It might not even be Greek. It's um, middle. It's not Middle Eastern. I think it's it, Greek or Egyptian. Anyway, he takes this figure from history and he explains it actually. If you go to one of the talks, and he basically just uses that character as a jumping-off point to talk about whatever he wants to do. It's this sense, and I, I'm going to talk about this in another video. And it's it's actually something that I wanted to write about in my. Um, journal my online journal the fiend i didn't get round to it i think i had some prose project which was going to be vaguely like reincarnation and poetry something really vaguely simple uh, something simple that everyone can grab hold of um i think the one thing that's happened in modest modernist poetry which does interest me a lot and it happened with pound and robert browning pound took something out of Robert Browning, addressed Robert Browning in a poem, and then suddenly he's found his project. And the project begins in Homer, and we'll get into that in another video. But what's interesting, and, and Pound also was, was spending time writing um, character pieces, which I also have found myself doing when I'm younger. You choose some object uh, some character in history or some even just some perspective it might not it might be very permeable ethereal you might not be able to put your finger on it but you're not speaking exactly it's not exactly you but it's not exactly anybody else either it's like this in between stage and the reason i mentioned the word reincarnation is i'm strongly um convinced in my thinking that this urge towards the monologue of a given character, a found character, supposedly by accident, by a given individual, is no accident. That the soul is searching for its past identities. And whether Olsen actually was Maximus of Tyre is a totally different question. I think we would need a hell of a lot more spiritual knowledge to ever come to that conclusion. But I do think it's interesting to throw around that theory because um, it does happen. And why do these personalities reappear over and over? It seems like any notion of reincarnation is mimicking 
The same thing in poetry is mimicking the, the idea of reincarnation, which is a character from history one is strongly attracted to, and then one speaks with that person's voice. Now, like I say, I'm not going to I'm not going to go so far into the historical aspect of it, but it's interesting. Why does it keep occurring? Um, of course, the naysayers, of course, say, well, you know, that's the thing about reincarnation. Everybody picks a historical figure. Why can't they pick Joe Bloggs from down the street? The only way I could respond to that is that um, I think a lot of it is total bunkum, and I would agree with them. But, but my, another side of me says, no, I think there's a genuine thing there, because I do believe, at least over centuries, that, that, that remarkable personalities... Uh, are acknowledged for what they do, particularly textually when they've been writing something. So it's not too much of a leap to assume that if somebody was uh, a great or a good or great writer, at least good enough to be to last centuries, reappears, you know, um, materially incarnates centuries down the line. Um, why could they not also be great? It, we're talking about souls here the wealth of knowledge within the soul as it goes through the, the, the incarnations. I think there's something in it, but I also have a healthy scepticism or enough to think that um, a lot of it is bunkum. And I think that is part of the charade of life, is that all genuine ideas have um, similar ideas which are all bunkum f tossed at them so that we can't actually acknowledge anything as the truth. I just think that's the way that, that, that being incarnated in the world, that's the way that it is. And and you, you are pushed into using your instincts and intuitions more and more. Your intellectual mind, less and less, or not less and less, but to have some form of balance. Anyway, that's by the by. I still think this is important, though, the fact that we adopt the older voices. Um, and, it, and it happens a lot. Uh, in Pound and in Olsen. So Maximus is in Dogtown, but so we're essentially transposing Olsen in Gloucester. So let's just read a few of these to give you a, a sense of uh, a sense of what the way that he's writing. So Songs of Maximus, Song One. They usually. Um, at least in this first volume, it's like divided between songs and letters, but it gets more complex as the thing goes on, so it, it, it's not worth giving any definition of it. Song one. Coloured pictures of all things to eat, dirty postcards, and words, 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 all over everything. No eyes or ears left to do their own doings. All invaded, appropriated, outraged, all senses, including the mind, that worker on what is. And that other sense, made to give even the most wretched, or any of us wretched, that consolation. Greased, lulled, even the streetcars song. Song two. All wrong, and I am asked, Ask myself, I too, covered with the gurry of it, where shall we go from here? What can we do when even the public conveyances sing? How can we go anywhere, even cross town? How get out of anywhere, the bodies all buried in shallow graves? Song 3 This morning of the small snow I count the blessings, the leak in the faucet, which makes of the sink time the drop of the water on water, as sweet as the Seth Thomas in the old kitchen my father stood in his drawers to wind, always he forgot the thirtieth day, as I don't want to remember, the rent, a house these days, so much somebody else's, especially Congoleum's, or the plumbing, that it doesn't work, this I like. I've even used paper clips as well as string to hold the ball up and flush it with my hand. But that the car doesn't, that no moving thing moves, 
without that song I'd void my ear of, the music racket of all ownership, holes in my shoes, that's all right, my fly gaping, me out at the elbows, the blessing that difficulties are once more. In the midst of plenty, walk as close to bear, in the face of sweetness, piss, in the time of goodness, go side, go smashing, beat them, go as near as you can tear. In the land of plenty, have nothing to do with it. Take the way of the lowest, including your legs. Go contrary, go sing. I'm going to intersperse these songs with a, an earlier letter from the same book. I like this because it feeds into my love of Celtic herbal medicine. Um, tansy is a, it's a plant, it's a, a root plant, and it's, it's, it's poisonous. Letter three, tansy buttons, tansy for my city, tansy for their noses, tansy for them, tansy for Gloucester to take the smell of all owners, the smell, tansy for all of us. Let those who use words cheap, who use us cheap, take themselves out of the way. Let them not talk of what is good for the city. Let them free the way for me, for the men of the fort who are not hired, who buy the white houses. Let them cease putting out words in the public print so that any of us have to leave, so that my Portuguese leave, leave the lady they gave us, sell their schooners with the greyhounds aft, the long diesels they put their money in, leave Gloucester in the present shame of, the wondership stolen by, ownership, tansy from Cressy's I rolled in as a boy, and didn't know it was tansy. I'm still unsure about ownership because, you know, Olsen doesn't like ownership very much, or at least in those pieces. I like ownership, so I don't get it. Uh, I don't think he's like some occult communist um, because he's all over the map politically in his poems, to be quite honest. Um, that, that first poem I read is all about conservation and preservation, so... It's tricky to know where you're at with that. I mean, it could be that there's a fall in poetry so that we're looking at people who are basically reading abstract philosophy as poetry. Um, I'm sure the American poets who, who came under his influence wouldn't like me saying something like that. It's possible. Um, in Britain, I think we look at things more in terms of lyric and song. So there's things you say when you're in the pub or when you're in society and then give us a song there's a separation there. Um, you know, in America, I see see that it's a lot more. There are a lot more grey areas across all of that, regardless of what your ideology is. Um, what else have we got here? Maximus to himself. I'm reading some of the more famous ones, but I'll, I'll try to read some obscure things as well. I have had to learn the simplest things last, which made for difficulties. Even at sea I was slow to get the hand out or to cross a wet deck. The sea was not, finally, my trade. But even my trade, at it, I stood estranged from that which was most familiar. Was delayed and not content with the man's argument that such postponement is now the nature of obedience. That we are all late in a slow time, that we grow up many and the single is not easily known. It could be, though the sharpness, the acciote, I note in others, makes more sense than my own distances. The agilities, they show daily who do the world's businesses and who do nature's as I have no sense I have done either. I have made dialogues, have discussed ancient texts, have thrown what light I could, offered what pleasures dociat allows, 
But the known? This I had to be given. A life, love, and from one man, the world. Tokens. But sitting here, I look out as a wind and water man, testing and missing some proof. I know the quarters of the weather, where it comes from, where it goes. But the stem of me, this I took from their welcome, or their rejection of me. And my arrogance was neither diminished nor increased by the communication. 2. It is undone business I speak of this morning, with the sea stretching out from my feet. I'll leave that first volume. Most people tend to read from that one because there's a few big pieces in there. Maximus at the Harbour from the second volume. This is he's actually split them into books, so we've got more than that. We've got book four, five, six in this second one. Okeanos rages, tears, rocks back in its in his path, encircling Okeanos, tears upon the earth to get love loose. That women fall into the clefts of women, that men tear at their legs and rape until love sifts through all things, and nothing is except love as stood upon the earth. Love to sit in the ring of Okeanos, love to lie in the spit of a woman, a man to sit in her legs. Her hemispheres loomed above me. I went to work like the horns of a snail. Paradise is a person come into this world. The soul is a magnificent angel, and the thought of its thought is the rage of ocean. Apophenistai roared the great bone unto Norman's woe. Apophenistai, as it blew up a pool on round rock shoal. Apophenistai, it cracked as it broke on pavilion beach. Apophenistai, it tore at watch house point. Two. Apophenistai got hidden all the years. Apophenistai, the soul in its progressive rise. Apophenistai passes in and out of more difficult things, and by so passing. Apophenistai, the act which act actuates the soul itself. She loomed before me, and he stood in this room. It sends out on the path ahead the angel it will meet. Apophenistai, its accent is its own mirage. Three. The great ocean is angry. It wants the perfect child. Bring that thing out, the monogene, the original unit, survives in the salt. I just stuck that on the end. It's a, it's a, it's a spare poem, but I thought it was a good one. Uh, yeah, so that's the middle section, early 60s. Is there anything else I can... Yes, let's try this one. There's a lot of, uh, well, obviously there's there's a lot of, um, what is it, Homer and, what's his great source? I'm, I'm very forgetful today. Um, I've got the thing here somewhere. Um, well, maybe I'll come back to that. Anyway, we're talking about mythologies, particularly uh, creation mythology. 
Maximus from Dogtown 4. A century or so before 2000 BC, the year re-began in March. Festival days of wild, untamed, undomesticated, hence wild, savage, feral, father's days, our father who is also in Tartarus, chained in being, kept watch on by Aegean Obrarios, whose exceeding manhood, excellent manhood, comeliness and power, 100 or possibly to use the term of change, with the reciprocal 1, 137th one of the two, pure numbers out of which the world is constructed. The other one is earth, mass, mother milk, cow, body, demonstrably, suddenly, more, primitive and universal. Hardly, the problem here is a non-statistical proof. Earth came into being extraordinarily early. Number two, in fact, directly following on appetite, or, as it reads in Norse hunger, as though in the mouth, which is an occurrence, is there, Stlocus, that the earth was the condition, and that she there, and then was the land, country, our dear fatherland, the earth, thrown up to form a cairn as spouse of Uranus, a -i -a, the original name of Colchis, could be a local reference that the great name the earth shall have been, Cubon, where those inventors of the vision, the civilizers, were local? Some short time prior to 2000 BC, the statistical stands outside the stream. Tartarus is beyond the gods, beyond hunger, outside the ends and source of earth. Heaven, ocean, stream, Obriarios, helped out by Poseidon by being given Sympolia, P's daughter, for wife sort of only superintends the other two jailers of those tied up in Tartarus, and those two, in other words, below, below, below is a factor of being, underneath is a matter, this is like the vault, you aren't all train of heaven, it counts if you leave out those roots of earth, which run down through ocean to the ends of ocean, as well the foundations of ocean. By earth's prompting and the advice of heaven, his grandparents, this person Zeus put the Iotans, those who strain, reach out, are hunger, put them aside, including the last at the youngest child of earth, her last one, by love of Tartarus, by the aid of love as Aphrodite made, strength in his hands and untiring feet, and made of all the virtues of ocean's children, snakes, a hundred heads, a fearful dragon, dark flickering tongues, the eyes in his marvellous heads flashed fire, and fire burned from his heads, when he looked at the enemy or as Shakti was shooting beams of love directly into the woman he wanted to be full of love, and there are voices inside all his dreadful heads uttering every kind of sound, imaginable, unspeakable Hugh White says, Hesiod says, not to be voiced, for at one time they made sounds such as solely the gods caught onto, but at another Typhon was a bull, when letting out his nature, at another the relentless lion's heart sound, and at another sounds like whelps, wonderful to hear, and again at another he would hiss so the sky would burn. They threw him into his father's place, it would take you one year, from the tossing in this direction, and that before you got to its pavement, Tartarus lies, so thoroughly out below, but outside, having nothing whatsoever to do with gods or earths, but suddenly a loss has been suffered. Tartarus was once ahead of heaven, was prior to, in coming into being, this child of earth. Tartarus.
was next after earth, as earth was next after hunger itself. Typhon was her child. By Tartarus, even if last as heaven was her child, first the step back to the seam of the statistical nebel and end of the world, out of the union of which by what occurrence was before. Hunger, it is like ocean which is nine times around earth and sea. Heaven is nine times around earth and sea, folding and folding earth and sea in its backward. It wraps and wraps the consistency of mass in until the stupid story of earth and nature is lent. What in its obviousness and effort it can't take time for and makes its stories up. Temporality sifts out of ocean out of ocean was born, three thousand. When his wife was Tethys, daughters Tartarus the prison, beyond the gods and men, beyond hunger, and the foundations of ocean, are a seam. Cotus and Gaius, with whom Briarios is the third guard, have their dwelling, ep okeanoion themethlois, the lowest part, the bottom, Tithemi, ocean deems himself on that edge or place. Inverted from ocean starts another place, Tartarus, in which all who have been by the statutory thrown down or overthrown are kept watch on night and day. Night's house is right over their heads, in which one door, day, goes out when her mother comes in, and neither are over together at the same time at home. Hell is just over their heads, and so is the way up. Bifrost, Styx's house, and Iris the messenger are bungled prettinesses of this way. This marvellous ladder, the colour of all colours, back where the gods and appetite, and so is the way out for them. For these imprisoned original created all of the first creations of earth and heaven, or of ocean and Tethys, all these instances, forwards of, except the official story. Heaven himself the second, Kronos, who acted for his mother in demalying his father, is in Tartarus, away from all the gods. While the glorious allies of loud crashing Zeus, Cotus and Gaius and Obriarios guard them. Typhon is in Tartarus, threatening as he did, as they had the last to give the gods a scare, who would have come to reign over mortals and immortals. The heat took hold on the dark blue sea, when Typhon and Zeus engaged. Hell trembled, where he rules over those who have come to him. And the Eotans before Typhon locked up in Tartarus swung from the clangor and the earth shaking. He burned all the marvellous heads of the monster and conquered him and lashed him and threw him down in his mother who groaned and a great part of her melted as tin does from the heat of him blasted where Zeus had tossed him and then in the bitterness of his anger Zeus tossed him into Tartarus. The life-giving earth had crashed around in burning the previous time when all the land had seethed and oceans streams and the sea had boiled and it was this lava like which had undone the earlier giants because they were earth-born. Earth's own meltedness had burned their underpinnings and defeated them against Zeus's stance. Cotus and Briarios and Gaius had done that day of the civilized war their turn for the boss with their missiles added to his bolts they did their coevals in and were the ones who chained them as the Theogonia poet says for all their great spirit their metathumos there it was Tartarus which had been there as early as hunger or at least directly after hunger and earth and before love 
yet love in the figure of the goddess born of the frith from her father's heavens parts accompanied tartarus as night had heaven the night his son had hurled off his parts love accompanied tartarus when with earth in love he made typhon thus march I looked up and saw its form through everything. It is sown in all parts, under and over. I can't help doing some radical different readings of um, something like that. I mean, he's trying to get at what is our sense of hell and what is the Greek sense of hell and what is outside and inside those definitions. Um, if you're into flat earth theory it throws up some questions <laughs> um, he's saying that Tartarus was outside somehow is that outside the firmament I don't know um, but it, it's I like that it's a really interesting poem again the postmodern tag comes in because you know you've got that sense of an urgent message and all sense of grammar is forestalled for what what the essence of the mythology he's talking about is um, I'm not sure why I picked that one I like this idea of like things just popping up uh, that perhaps have more meaning I don't know it's the tarot technique bibliomancy um, all right I'll leave that volume Again, I don't want to make this too long, and it's already gone on an hour, so um, I think I'll just read one or two from this. You know, all these volumes don't normally have uh, contents. I do know some of the names of the poems, but... And they're very, uh, like, uh, difficult to pin down anyway, because... We don't know where one poem ends and another begins sometimes. It's even more tricky than Robert Duncan's poetry. But this is the thing of like breaking down, having a serial poem and then kind of breaking the serial poem down as well. I mean, I have the same problem in my writing. It's like it seems to be limited to notebooks. You either write out the whole note, type out the whole notebook, or you don't bother at all. You know, it, as you go along, everything seems equally significant, it's significant for some reason. I don't know why. This is a late poem. A lot of the later poems, are, you have this vigil aspect where he's just kind of around Gloucester, and it's it's much more kind of he's, he seems to be writing more at night, or at least that's how I remember it. Um, we've got these wonderful uh, crazy shape poems, acrostic. Just as morning twilight and the gulls, Gloucester, May 1966, the full flower moon. Just as morning twilight and the gulls start talking, the cinnamon moon goes down over Stage Fort Park, one night short of full, as I too, almost full, also leave all those who, whom I have thought were equally moving, equally at least as much a part of this world and its character as these rounds of planets the sun within 31 further minutes will have started lighting up the east across east gloucester arm and if i add this house or its place on the earth three solid powers of being pass in property and principle a causal also in this empirical world as i and I still cannot believe my friends aren't too, no matter what they choose or may. Identity itself, a recognition, cognition, that this moon in itself is cinnamon and bore an image in my life as it now going on to China will, twelve hours from now, bring tides again on this side, reverse flow to the effect of its presence, here twelve other hours. 
I do not speak of solar piston iron force effect on both there and my these two friends a man and woman I have had reason to say were only brother sister never, never having but one a brother who died at birth a year before myself was born that they or I were not affected to in birth and or conception or in both by either ions stored in earth or thrown at her by the sun at equinox like fluctuation to the moon's twi-tidal effect go down moon and teach me too to swallow what by analogy and continuity i now at fifty-five know is as much condition as the purchase of my soul by love as they There's a great expanse, isn't there? I mean, they say he was a big man, but the poetry is quite... It's got that wide-ranging feel. It's not minutiae. It's like... I've talked about that in other videos, you know, like certain poets are poets of minutiae and, and, and other poets are poets of the macrocosm or something. I think I said Whitman was macrocosm. Um, yeah. That wasn't a great reading, but... Um, not a bad poem. Uh, he's trying to encompass all of human history and all of geographical space and take it all in within these instances of poetry and he does it in a very different way than say a romantic British poet would do it it's interesting alright I might leave the rest for you guys to investigate if you so wish um that's my take on Charles Olson. Um, I think I've said enough, have I? What else is there to say? Um, he's a great kind of philosopher, poet, um, and really gives you another option out of that Second War, World War situation, the post-war situation, which seems to me to, at least in modernism, it comes through Lawrence and Joyce. Those are the two kind of avenues you have you don't have to choose them but but those tend to be the 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 autodidact direct address of Lawrence and Lawrence's poems which I'll get into in another video and then you've got the utter ambiguity and dream strangeness of Joyce and Olsen's kind of positioning himself more with the that's the other thing about Lawrence is that those all of these writers are saturated in Lawrence oftentimes without knowing it uh, which is not like our generation now we don't read Lawrence D.H. Lawrence very much and we definitely don't study his poetry but I think this was a different time maybe I'm playing with this too much but 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 he is it, there is a direct focus what's what's changed is that he no longer the the poet doesn't feel like he has to come to a point it doesn't there's no, there's no result there's no conventional grammar Lawrence always kept certain, certain linguistic conventions. As we get into post-war times, we don't lo no longer have that. Now that some people might have a problem with that, the breakdown of that. I don't have a problem with it necessarily. Um, it depends on the journey. What information are you picking up along the journey? I mean that that um, Tartarus mythology piece is is wonderful in that sense, like. What are you picking up? This try this guy is trying to encompass a, a world in quite literal fashion. And the other thing I really appreciate about Olsen is that he's rejected. He he's a scientist. You can tell that he's trying to gain some kind of scientific knowledge out of the mythology. I take mythology to be true. That's why people say it's just a myth, right? Because we live in a society which loathes truth. And the myth is the truth, and you can ignore it to your peril. But that's what it—that's what it's—it's it's information. It's trying to tell you something about cosmology and astrology and and the birth of yourself as a human, and as part of a human community. So what was I trying to say there? Um, yes, he has that kind of reach. Um, anyway, and. Um, 
what seems to be happening in the post-war period, particularly in American po poetry, is that there's an easiness with that. There's an easiness with the abstract. You don't need an equal footing of, of one convention to another. So I feel something and I put it down in the, in the form of a poetic line and then it's got full stops in it and it's got all the conventions that we're used to of 19th century poet, poetry. That's all gone out the window now. I think even Dylan Thomas, if he'd, if he'd have been around in the 70s and was reading Charles Olson, I wonder what he, how he would have dealt with that, that kind of approach. Would he just have said, oh, poetry's gone to hell in a handbasket? Or, or, you know, would George Barker have said the same thing? He didn't like Kerouac, for example. Um, what studying writing like this teaches you is to chill out. Um, to accept different forms of this poetic inception into material reality. Um, I, th I would imagine Olsen's influence will last for a long time. I certainly still get something from uh, reading stuff like that. In many ways, um, Olsen is not enough, as it were. Um, the problem with um, those generations um, gleaning enough of mythology but then having this sense of science and all of that they're leaning less on the official mythology which is perhaps the only problem with it did they know enough of mythology and too much of science which goes back to the point I was trying to make before one thing I like about Olsen is that he doesn't like any of the scientific figures of the 20th century uh, because that's the funny thing if you take McClure or you take certain other people it's registered in their poetry that Einstein's good or um, Marilyn Monroe you know I mean I would never talk about somebody like that I mean it just doesn't interest me obviously that's poetic concern it's whatever interests you at the time I mean God knows what we think about these things decades later either so, but anyway to stick on the scientific point yeah uh, Einstein isn't there for Olsen you know um, if you're going to write poetry about scientific speculation, he, he, he's not in that mix. I think maybe he was for Olsen in his early life. But um, that's interesting. I mean, watch some YouTube videos on the myth of Einstein or something like that. I think of, what is it, um, Deep Thoughts Radio is the one to go to, you know. Watch some, uh, watch some videos on how... how scientific conventions of the 20th century were doubtful or, or, or uh, the certain discoveries, discoveries were were problematic uh, the fact that at least the whole of the world that's on the internet prefers Tesla over Einstein or Tesla over some of the inventors of the 19th century that that tells you quite a lot I mean it's interesting I think Olsen can feed into all of that tumult of what is scientifically true and does the truth come out of poetic vision. I personally think as a poet it does. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, the average um, scientist ensconced in an academy won't figure too much out. Go back to McClure for one second. Francis Crick is M McClure's great avatar of scientific um, discovery. You could look into Crick yourself. He, he was the guy that discovered the um, the helix DNA uh, symbol or actual um, DNA strand. I think it's said that he discovered that because of an acid trip that he'd had. So again, moments of vision, uh, proto-shamanic activity. It can account for most of the world's science, possibly, if you think magically or shamanically. But that is another video. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, those are my ramblings about Charles Olson. I hope you've enjoyed them. I'll make another video soon. Ta-ta.